Chapter 6 The Experience of Oneness Jefferson University neuroscientist Andrew Newberg and the University of Pennsylvania neuropsychologist Eugene De Aquili gave us our first real insight into the experience of oneness. Back in 1991, they were investigating a different version of oneness, the kind produced by meditation. In deep contemplative states, Tibetan Buddhists report absolute unitary being, or the feeling of becoming one with everything, while Franciscan nuns experience unia mystica, meaning oneness with God's love. So Newberg and De Aquili put both Buddhists and nuns inside a single emission computed tomography, SPECT, scanner, to figure out if there's a biology beneath this spirituality. The SPECT scan revealed biology all right, and hyperfrontality to be exact. In moments of intense concentration, the same efficiency exchange that erases our sense of self and distorts our sense of time begins to impact our relationship with space. This hypofrontality occurs farther back in the cortex, in the superior parietal lobe, to be exact, instead of taking place in the prefrontal lobes, in a portion of the brain that Newberg and De Aquili dubbed as the Orientation Association Area, OAA, because it helps us orient in space. When functioning normally, the OAA is a navigation system. It judges angles and distances, maps course trajectories, and keeps track of our body's exact location. But to do this last part, the superior parietal lobe must also produce a boundary line, the border of self, the division between finite, us, and the infinite, not us, that is the rest of the universe. Obviously drawing this border is no simple task, so the OAA depends on a constant stream of incoming messages. All of our senses send data to the OAA. Incredible calculations occur, but all of this takes a lot of energy. When that energy is needed elsewhere, like during moments of intense focus, the OAA stops performing those calculations because it stops receiving those data signals. Without this data stream, this part of the brain is temporarily blinded. It too becomes hypofrontal and to incredible result. Once this happens, says Newberg, we can no longer draw a line and say this is where the self ends and this is where the rest of the world begins. So the brain concludes, it has to conclude, that at this moment, you are one with everything. This is a somewhat startling reversal. Ever since Aldous Huxley told the world about his experiment with mescaline, the idea has been that the doors of perception needed to be opened for cosmic unity to be revealed. Newberg and De Aquili discover the inverse. With hypofrontality, attention is narrowing. Parts of the brain are shutting down. Oneness is the result of the narrowing of the doors of perception, not throwing them wide open. Newberg and De Aquili also discovered that what you focus on matters. Surfers, with their attention entirely on a wave, become one with the wave. Meditating Franciscan nuns had God's love in mind, so their experience was oneness with God's love. There's little difference between the type of concentration a meditator needs to achieve ecstasy and the type required by a surfer dropping into a big wave. Focus is focus. The problem is fear, which stands between us and all actions. Yet our fears are grounded in self and time. With our sense of self out of the way, we are liberated from doubt and insecurity. With time gone, there is no yesterday to regret or tomorrow to worry about. And when our sense of space disappears, so do physical consequences. But when they vanish all at once, something far more incredible occurs. Our fear of death, the most fundamental of all fears, can no longer exist. Simply put, if you are infinite and atemporal, you cannot die. This is another reason why flow states significantly enhance performance. When the self disappears, it takes many of our limits along for the ride. 